enlighten you today as to why the rich get richer, simply because they don't have to pay as much tax, as at least a percentage of tax, as you do. So it's a very important show because it's tax time coming up around the corner. And if, if you're saying, well, I should have done tax planning, I hate to say this might be too late, but there's still next year. There's still hope for next year. So, Kim, what do you want to say about taxes? Because that's, that's one of our favorite subjects because taxes make the rich richer. Yes, and most people don't understand that. So most people are thinking, oh, my God, tax day is coming up, and they cringe, and all they can think about is how much tax they're going to pay. Um, so, yeah, as you said, if they're starting to plan today, it's a little too late. However, we're going to have some experts on our show that are going to show us how the tax system can work to your advantage and to benefit from them, from the tax system instead of being at the effect of it. So our guests today are Rich Dad Advisor, Tom Wheelwright. He is my expert on taxes. He's the founder and CEO of ProVision, the premier strategic CPA firm, and he's the author of Tax-Free Wealth. His website is ProVisionWealth.com. And I've never met this gentleman before, but as Kim says, he blew my head up into a balloon. <laughs> Talk know, about I mean, being validated. You know, I'm, I'm doing my best to be humble and you know all that other stuff, but it's tough. It's Ed McCaffrey. He's an internationally recognized expert in tax law, teaching at USC. He's also a contributor to CNN.com, and he's author of Tax Planning 101, Buy, Borrow, Die, Fair Not fat, Flat, Fair Not Flat, Fat, but How to Make the Tax System Better and Simpler. And the reason your head gets bigger is because Ed is actually using the tax, your, your rich dad, poor dad principles at the USC Law School, and it doesn't get a lot better than that. Yeah, that'd be like the Pope endorsing me or something <laughs> like this. It, it really doesn't get better. So, yeah, Hi, I'm, everybody, but this is Ed, and I'm really happy to be on this show. <laughs> and, uh, listeners, uh, Robert is not puffing his own head. I, we talked before, and I just told him how honored I was, and, and Kim, and to have... Uh, Tom, also on the phone, because I think the the tax planning advice that comes out of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, I think we should be learning that in kindergarten. I think that Amen. that's Amen. very Amen. important, so, essential advice. And uh, what Robert and his various uh, uh, colleagues and co-authors have done has been to make that clear and understandable. So, Ed, Ed, so I hope Ed, all listeners you know, continue to listen. So I'm happy here. Thank to be you. here talking about Thank that. You, so, so let's. Uh, so, Tom, like you've been on the program many times, but for those who haven't had you on the pro, haven't heard you before, please give your background on what qualifies you to talk about taxes, because I, I don't have those qualifications. But Tom guides me in my writing and making it simple for people like Kim and I to understand. So, Tom, what is your background when it comes to tax? Well, so I have a master's of tax from University of Texas, um, little school down in Austin. And uh, spent uh, many years with uh, um, one of the big four accounting firms, Ernst & Young, including uh, three years in their national tax office when the last major tax act was passed, 1986. And then the last 20-some-odd uh, years um, have been um, really working directly with entrepreneurs and investors and really teaching them that uh, taxes can work in their favor if they understand, you know, the basics uh, of taxes. And, and Tom, you say you work, you work primarily with entrepreneurs and investors because those are the people that can take advantage of the tax laws, correct? Right. If, if, you're, a high, if you're a high wage earner, there's, quite frankly, there's, and, and that's all, and you're saving your money, there's not a lot, I can, you know, we can do for you. So the people that we can really uh, help are the people that are, you know, as, as Ed says, you know, they're the ones who are, are buying, and then we, we, we borrow it, and then, you know, hopefully we push the death out a, a little ways. But uh, uh, that's actually something, um, by the way, Ed, that is uh, an example I use. So buy, borrow, and die is a, an example I use in my book, Tax-Free Wealth. I use Great. That. Well, we're, we're all on the same page, and right. I think that's a page that Robert really helped us to to start. And, and everything Tom said, I, I would agree with. It's a kind of uh, clever of the Kiyosakis to have someone from Texas and someone from USC on the same phone call. Not <laughs> <laughs> in what happened a few years ago in, in that department. Right. When you take buy, bar, die, and uh, the buy part, it comes from Robert and Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Rule number one, buy assets. When you have an asset and that asset goes up in value, uh, you don't pay tax on that. You don't have to report that income until and unless you sell it. And, of course, the plan here is not to sell it. So you buy and hold. You buy assets. 
And then if you need wealth to live on because it's hard to eat unrealized appreciation, you're going to borrow. That is a strategy that allows Warren Buffett and people like Warren Buffett and the entrepreneurs that uh, Tom advises to pay almost nothing. But it is also a strategy that is available to a more middle class or upper middle class audience. For example, you buy a house. Uh, hopefully many of our listeners have done that. It's a lovely thing to do, and not just because of the mortgage interest deduction. The house goes up in value. If it's a house in Hawaii or California or Texas, eventually you hold it long enough, it will go up in value. When you want to pay for your kid's education, when you want to go on a trip, what do you do? You borrow against your house. Uh, and that's a way, and if you keep doing that, actually, if you sell your house, you get some of that gain back tax-free, and you can pay off your debt. Ed, this is, thank you for all that, but I want you to introduce yourself first. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean you know, yeah. we know who you are. <laughs> We're, you know, but I'm, I am. Yeah, I understand. Ed gets as excited about taxes as I do. I, I know, You're the only I two people I know that get so excited about but taxes. Ed, Ed, the point here is this, is, you know, if, if I said such things, nobody would listen to me. Because right. I have no credibility, but your your CV, your credibility is incredible. So before we right. well, further, I'm not. Sure, I'm not uh, that's kind of you. I'm not sure all the readers will agree. No. But uh, <laughs> it, I did go to Yale College and then Harvard Law School. Uh, I've been teaching, and then I got a degree in economics from USC when I was teaching here. I've basically been teaching tax at USC since 1989. I also teach law and economics at the California Institute of Technology, and I've taught tax at Yale Law School, uh, UCLA Law School, and Harvard uh, Law School. I've written several books. Robert was kind to mention them. Uh, just so people you know, don't think I'm some kind of you know, brilliant genius, I'm enough of an idiot that I'm trying to take <laughs> these basic principles of tax that Robert and Tom and Kim and other people are, are explaining to people like the listeners and the readers as a way to help them live their lives in a, in a tax-free or tax-reduced manner so they, they can have more wealth for themselves. So, what I'm trying to do is take those principles and explain them to politicians to help fix the tax system. And that is a hopeless quest. So uh, I, I am not as well dressed or as so, well paid as anybody else on this phone. So Ed, but, Ed, uh, we we'll love your message. I just thank you for you know for the years and years and years of saying what I was saying, and most people thought I was talking about tax evasion, you know, and that's not what we're talking about here. So in a simple question, I'm going to ask Tom this question: Is it legal for the rich to pay no tax? Certainly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's all I'm saying. Because because every time when for all the years I was you know talking about tax, which I have no credibility in, people would say you're talking about evasion, aren't you? And the thing that Tom and I always talk about, there's a lot of people who do talk about tax evasion, but the average person doesn't know about it. Isn't that yeah. correct, Tom? Well, and and, it's, oh. and and that's a good vocabulary there, Robert. Tax evasion is criminal. Wesley Snipes most recently did that. That's when you get a bunch of money and you just stick it under your mattress or put it in another country and don't tell the government you got that money. The key to tax-free investing, the key to Rich Dad's advice, is that you don't show that income in the first place. Again, the lovely quote from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, rule number one is to buy assets. How we learn more. You listen to this program one more time and you'll hear 30% more and you'll also retain longer than if you listen to this program once. And secondly... If you have a friend or an accountant that needs to listen to this program, go to richdadradio.com and dial up this segment on taxes. Any comments, Kim? Yes, yeah, so this is a very, very timely show because actually there are, th there are things that you can do regarding your taxes. And we have two experts with us today, Tom Wilwright, who is a rich dad, our Rich Dad advisor on taxes. He advises Robert and myself, and he keeps it very simple so that we understand what's going on out there. His book is Tax-Free Wealth. And also Ed McCaffrey. He's an internationally recognized expert in tax law. He teaches at USC Law School, and he is the author of Tax Planning 101, Buy, Borrow, Die. And he actually uses Rich Dad, Poor Dad in his teaching at USC. And that, that is, you know, my head. I'm going to float out of this room right now, Ed. <laughs> So anyway, uh, just for those who, who may not understand the Rich Dad philosophy, is that when you say to your child, go to school, which is my poor dad, I always say go to school and get a job. 
The moment you are working for money, you become a tax and wage slave. So what Tom has been teaching Kim and I and guiding us all these years, but also teaches Rich Dad listeners, which is Ed does, there's also ways you can legally minimize tax. And one of the things Tom always talks about is not that taxes are punishment. Taxes punish people who work for money. But it also is an incentive for those who do what the government wants done. Any comments on that, Tom, that that distinction between tax law are incentives to do what I do? I invest in houses, in apartment houses, oil wells, and things like that. I have a company because we have employees. I'm doing what the government wants done. On the other side of it, the socialists like Hillary and Bernie Sanders are saying we're cheating the system. They call it loopholes. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, no question. And, and well, what happened was, and, and, and Ed, Ed can, can back me up on this, I'm sure, is that the government learned years and years and years ago that, first of all, people hate paying taxes. So if you give somebody a, a small, relatively small tax incentive, they will do big things with it. They will go after it. They will b- build low-income housing. I mean, can you imagine what, what, what little amount of low-income housing we would have without that tax incentive? That's, that's the incentive depreciation in real estate, um, uh, depletion and uh, intangible drilling costs and oil and gas, uh, business deductions. I mean, everybody knows that, boy, they, they've got, everybody's got a friend, even if they, they're a wager. They've got a friend that has a small business, and they say, I get to write off part of my house. I get to write off part of my car. I get to do all these write-offs. These are intentional because the government wants people to build business because if people build business, they grow the economy, if, and, and they um, actually create additional jobs. And so, so, and so Tom, it's, it's even, policy. even if they have a part-time, they have a full-time job, and they have a part-time business, they still get these tax incentives, correct? A- absolutely. I mean, that's the thing, is that the, the tax law, you know, as Ed was talking about earlier, is that, you know, the tax law is not just for the rich. The tax law is actually for the entrepreneur. So it, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be the, the entrepreneur that is out there making millions and millions of dollars. It can be the entrepreneur out there making, you know, fifty hundred thousand dollars a year. They still get the same tax benefits. The other thing that you talk about that gets people's uh, the hair on the back raises up, they also give you tax incentives for charitable donation, right? Uh, yes, and in fact, they just actually in the last tax law that was passed in December, they gave some additional charitable, um, additional incentives for charitable uh, donations. But this is a good example. Ed's talking about um, uh, <laughs> buy, build, and, and, and die, is that when you, if, if you buy stock, buy appreciated stock, and you give it away, you don't pay tax on the, on the gain, and you get a deduction for the full value of the stock. So that, that's like a twofer. I mean, you get, you get both. You don't pay tax and you get the deduction. So once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And today we're talking about taxes because it's the election year, you know, and Hillary's talking about taxing the rich. But I want Ed to go in on this because what Tom, Kim, and I understand, they don't really tax the rich. They tax the rich who work for money, the wage the guys. High earn, the high wage earner. Yeah, and, and just for your edifications, this is what Tom taught us, is there's three basic types of income. One is ordinary, which is when you work for a, when you work for a company, it's ordinary income. Your savings are taxed at ordinary income rates, and your four hundred one k is ordinary income. So they punish the poor and middle class. There's capital gains, which Wall, Wall Street runs heavily on capital gains. It's a thing called CEW, corporate equity withdrawal. It's like you take you borrowing out money from your house. So the rich get really rich by jacking up the stock market, borrowing this all out. They don't pay tax on it. And then there's cash flow, or also called passive income. So Kim and I are very, very heavily involved in passive income or cash flow, which is why we never need a job, because our income comes basically coming in at us tax-free. The more we buy more real estate, the less tax we pay, because we're using debt, which the government wants us to use. So those things are like taboo subjects to the poor and middle class, so it's a little hard to understand. So we're very grateful to have Ed McCaffrey again, <laughs> went to those little schools called Harvard Yale Prep School, <laughs> you know what I mean? And he is an attorney. So I want to make sure that I'm glad he's on. I thank him for supporting our work. But what do you have to say about that? I mean, it's, it's a shift in mindset primarily for many people, right, Ed, 
on taxes? Well, that's absolutely right, uh, Robert. And and all three of you have really uh, hit on the main theme, which is that wage earners, people who go and work traditional jobs, they're the ones who are financing the government. And people who can live off a more entrepreneurial lifestyle or who can live off their savings can avoid and really eliminate taxes. And let's put another piece into the explanation for that, which is the government's competence. The government, the IRS, isn't all that competent. They're not that well-funded. They're not that competent. If you're working in a traditional way, your employer is rat-thinking on you. He's, uh, the employer is sending in a W-2 form because the employer wants to take a tax deduction for the salary that he pays you. And that W-2 form goes to a computer, and the computer tells you how much you're going to pay. That's why, one, the good news for the poor and the middle class, they don't have to pay very much to prepare their taxes. H&R Block will do it for practically free because it's simple. The bad news is they're going to be taxed in a very difficult-to-avoid way. So everybody on this phone call is exactly right. The key to keeping more of your money is to get off the treadmill of a traditional salary job where your taxes are very difficult to avoid and get on to a more independent path where you're investing, you're owning assets, you're doing real estate as the Kiyosakis do. That's the key to the whole thing. Wages, working, salary, highly taxed, ordinary rates, as Robert said, the highest rates. And then to Kim's point about what's coming down the pike and the politics, Hillary Clinton is proposing increasing taxes on wage earners. When she says uh, taxing the rich, she says tax. she's going to tax the rich. She's not really taxing the truly rich, is she? Yeah, if you have a W-2 that shows more than $5 million a year, a W-2, <laughs> you're I taking did. a salary <laughs> of more than $5 million a year, Hillary's raising your taxes. Uh, not hey, many people so, in that category. So, so here, here, here's a great <laughs> quote on, on this one. Robertson Williams, who's, who's at the um, Tax Foundation, he says, the Clinton proposal would surely push some high-income taxpayers into paying taxes higher uh, than middle-class households. But because of the nature of their income, some higher-income people could still be paying relatively low taxes. That's what we're talking about. Right. Absolutely. And Absolutely that, right. And and also, if by the way, you're earning $5 million a year, you don't have to show all of that in salary. You have plenty of wealth. Convert it to stock, stock options, put it offshore. Lots of things you can do. Legally. If you make more than $5 million a year. If you're making $40,000 a year... You know, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and start trying to think of redirecting your life because the government is not going to help you if you're making $40,000 a year. Thank you. Once again, it's Robert Kiyosaka, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The subject today is tax time. The tax man is coming after you. If you're thinking about tax planning and what we're saying here is if you drank the Kool-Aid of going to school and getting a job and working hard and saving money, you're paying the highest taxes possible. And until you change your thinking via financial education or whatever, your taxes will just keep going up the more money you make. Our guests today are Tom Wheelwright, Rich Dad Advisor on Taxes, founder and CEO of ProVision, the premier strategic CPA firm specializing in dealing with professional entrepreneurs and investors. He's the author of Tax-Free Wealth, a very simple book written for the layperson like us. His website is ProVisionWealth.com. And very honored guest today is Ed McCaffrey, internationally recognized expert in tax law, teaching at USC. He's the author of Tax Planning 101, Buy, Borrow, and Die. It's really how the rich use tax strategies and planning to make more money and pay less in taxes, I think, which most of us would like to do. Comments, Kim? Yeah, well, well, now we're in 2016. It's an election year, and I'd like to ask, um, start with Tom and ask, you know, this the whole election season, you know, they're all talking about changing, reforming the tax system, all of this. What's your opinion on whoever gets elected? Is, is this going to affect me as a taxpayer? Uh, I think it only affects you positively, Kim. Um, How so? Realistically. Realistically. Be, well, because, what, of course, what the Republicans want to do, they want to actually reduce the rates. So if they reduce your rate, I mean, reduce the rates isn't bad. 
But the, the key is it, it's it's what this Williams said in this in this uh, uh, quote about the Hillary Clinton is that because of the nature of your income, that's not going to change. The, because the nature of the government is such that they want to promote certain activities, that as long as you're following those activities, it can't hurt you. And frankly, I think it could only help you. Any comments on that, Ed? Com- election time? Yeah, I really just take the other side of the coin, not to disagree with Tom, but to put that same point in different ways. The government, you know, any politician is going to do what's easy. Republicans, if they want to appeal to, you know, an anti-tax uh, electorate, are going to lower tax rates, as, as Tom said. And Democrats, like Hillary, are going to continue to tax wage earners. They're not going to do the complicated work to figure out how to reverse course. So uh, more to, for, let me give you an example. Obama didn't really raise income taxes until 2012. He wanted to, he didn't. But he quintupled federal cigarette taxes, taxes on cell phones, cigarettes, sales taxes, wage taxes of all forms. They're going up. And there's a saying that in the land of the blind, the one-eyed is king. People who even have a one-eye perspective on rich dad, poor dad, the entrepreneurs, the investors, the savers, They're not really going to be touched exactly as Tom said. So I think the message of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the tax message of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is that it's foolish from a tax perspective to go to work and draw a salary, that is going to continue to become more and more true as governments that need money go to the easiest thing to do, increase wage taxes, Ed, you just scared me. <laughs> yeah, knock down that ordinary income, Robert. Okay, let's get no, that it's... work harder because it any ordinary income has a big target on its back, uh, and it, those are very easy changes to make. To say instead of thirty nine point six, we'll have a forty five percent rate. Uh, very easy to just increase the squeeze on the working classes, and that's what we're seeing. Wow, Ed. You know, I tell you what. I, I, I thank you very much for your uh, integrity, your comments, and your generosity and humility. You know, like I said, it does back up my rich dad, and as Tom knows for years, every time I talked about not paying taxes or reducing taxes legally, most people are so afraid of the IRS or An audit. changing audits and all this stuff, they just freeze up and do nothing. So. You know, they, they're so afraid of the IRS, they don't you know, keep their job, and they don't do anything. And they just work harder and pay more tax. And, if, and if, final words, Ed, because we're going to go to break. Well, certainly aloha. And, uh, <laughs> and I think a final word is everything that you're doing and saying, Robert and Kim, and Tom is giving that advice, everything you're saying is perfectly true. Uh, I think whether that makes for a more sensible world is a big question. And it would be nice if politicians would actually care for the working people instead of taking advantage of the working people Amen. and taking advantage of the fact that people don't understand taxes to do this headline-grabbing stuff that makes for bad policy. So amen to everybody. Um, you know, you'll hear 30% more, retain 30% more, because taxes are your single largest expense if, exactly as Ed McCaffrey says, you're a wage earner. If you went to school and you got a job, you're paying way too much taxes, and you cannot get out of that because the more money you make, you just move into another tax bracket. So that's why this program is a very, very important program. You can listen to this program. It's, everything's archived at richdadradio.com, and you have a friend or a family member who really needs to understand taxes because when, when, when Kim and I and Tom talk to people about taxes, their eyes glaze over. They're so afraid of a thing called an IRS audit And they're so afraid they're doing something illegal, they'd rather do nothing, work harder, and pay higher taxes. And our special guest, as always, is Tom Wheelwright, Rich Dad Advisor on Taxes. And he guides Kim and I on our tax, how how we work, how we invest, and what we do to legally minimize taxes. Tom is the founder of ProVision, premier strategic firm. He's author of Tax Free Wealth. You can go to his website called ProVisionWealth.com and find out, especially if you're an entrepreneur and a professional investor, 
Tom is the premier guy, right, Kim? Yeah, and you know his book, Tax Free Wealth. If you have a tax, a CPA, a tax strategist on your team, I would get this book and ask a lot of the questions that Tom raises because a lot of tax preparers do not know this information, and they're not giving people the best advice, and they're costing people a lot of money. So I would recommend getting Tax Free Wealth and bring it to your advisor. Well, unfortunately, many CPAs pay the highest taxes too. <laughs> True, you know, because they're afraid of the thing called the audit, and they're so afraid of the IRS that they don't even think about about doing something differently. So going into Tom, uh, could you explain the difference between ordinary income, capital gains, and cash flow? Or they're also called ordinary portfolio passive. So my rich dad always told me to work for passive income or cash flow. That's what rich dad, poor dad's about. Whereas my poor dad always said, go to school, work hard, get a job, save money, and have a 401k, and that's ordinary income. So there's three types of income. And we give, give the distinction on that, okay? Would you mind take a sure. moment on that? No, a- absolutely. So, so think of, uh, of ordinary income as income you work for, okay? So when you say the rich don't work for money, the rich don't work for ordinary income because ordinary income is money that you work for. So uh, for, that's why a 401k is ordinary income because you worked for that money. Okay, so anything you work for is going to be ordinary income. If you flip houses, you're working for that money. That's ordinary income. Capital gain. Wait, wait, wait. And savings, is, savings, and interest on savings, right, is also ordinary? That's ordinary income, too. And, and you know, that's kind of an odd one because that, that's like, well, you didn't, you know, I, I think it's because you worked for the money and then you put it aside, and now, and now that money's paying interest, and so therefore – you know, you're paying ordinary income. That's the best way I can think of that. But I, not that I think that's particularly good policy. But that's the way it is. Okay, so that's ordinary income. Capital gains, think of it as this is, uh, this is something that is uh, a function of time. So as something goes up in value, okay, that's taxed to capital gains. So whether it's stocks or business or uh, a house. real estate, a house, whatever it is, as it goes up in value over time, Okay, then it's capital gains, and capital gains historically have been taxed at about half the uh, tax rate of ordinary income. So it's about half the rate. So and my well, like my father bought his house for fifty thousand, it went up to a million. So he had a capital gains there of about nine hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's what you're right. saying. And the opposite right. of That's- that is if the if the if you buy it and the price goes down over time and you sell it, it's a capital <laughs> loss. Yeah, I mean, that happens, loss. too. Capital a lot of people experience that. Experience. Yeah. Capital losses are horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so also what, what Tom, what Ed was talking about, he says save, and he's talking about if you save stocks and it goes up in capital gains, exactly as we do in real estate, you can borrow out the gain. Is that, is that true, using debt? Yeah, true. Yeah. Any, anytime you borrow because you owe the money back, I mean, it's not really income. Anytime you borrow, it's going to be tax-free. And so Ed's, Ed's absolutely right. And and so you can do it that way. You know, if, if you're living on capital gains, and we don't typically talk a lot about capital gains because that's, you know, that's a that's a buy, hold, and pray strategy. But um, if, if, if you do that, then yeah, you can absolutely borrow it out tax free. And, and if, and even if you sold it, you'd only pay 20, you know, 15 to 20%. So. so the point here is this, when guys say live debt free, they don't know what they're talking about when it, from <laughs> right. the rich dad side, right? <laughs> if you live debt free, you're paying really high taxes. Right. So no there's question. a way, this is, and this is what financial education is about. Which was an honor to have Ed McCaffrey acknowledging rich dad, because, you know, we've been kind of the, um, outlier for a while here. And what's the difference right. in cash flow or passive income? Well, so passive income is is actually income that uh, somebody else works for. Okay? So think of it as ordinary income is income that you work for. Passive income is income that somebody else works for. So it could be in, in, employees who work for it. It could be uh, Ken McElroy who works for it, and you get the passive in, You know, it's passive to you. Um, anything or your that tenants. Your tenants pay your rent your tenants pay right your tenants are paying you so they're they're working right that you're not working they're working to pay you so it's it's passive income is somebody else is working for it and they're paying you for owning that asset okay they're owning they're they're paying for the use of the asset or for 
um, or, or, or for the use of your money. Um, if, if you, in the case of a business, if you were to invest in a business, you could get passive income from a business too. And because the business owner is using your money, and so it's kind of rent on the money. So, so passive income in many ways is, is like rent, no matter what it is that you're investing in. It's, it's, it's actually a form of rent. Right, and that's when, right. when when I write a book, you know, that income comes in, and what that, what kind of income is that? Well, Royalties. That's that's ordinary income. Right. That's ordinary income, and that's why it's important for you to have the passive. The, you you actually have passive. You you actually have have the the losses. You have ordinary losses that offset the ordinary income, and, and that's that, very important to have both of those. And the losses come from investing in oil and gas and real estate. That's right, because Kim's a professional investor, and this is what this is this is what makes those. So Kim's not technically passive. I mean, the, the the income may come in, and she somebody else is working for it, but because because Kim works with it, now it becomes active, and those losses you get to take against your business income and your royalty income. So yeah. the last thing is this: is you know, when some people are listening right now, and number one, they're terrified of the IRS. They've never, you know, they think what we're talking about is evasion not avoidance. And so haven't you seen that more people would just rather pay it than go through the fear? I do. I, 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 had, this, uh, I had this amazing conversation with a, another CPA the other day, and she was arguing with me over borrowing out money, debt, um, she, she kept saying, well, you know, if you, I, I said, look, I said, our clients tend to be in a 25% or lower tax bracket. She says, well, how can they live on that? <laughs> just like, you just have no idea. I mean, it, talk about this tax education, and it's yeah. I, I I think in her case, she's going. I mean, she's a an agent of the U.S. government because she's telling people, well, you know, you you've you've got to pay tax because if you're going to have a nice lifestyle, you have to, you know, that's that's what you have to do. You have to pay tax to have that nice lifestyle. I'm going why. Why, why, would you, why would you ever do that? Well, that, and, that no and that goes to the point I hear from a lot of people. They say, oh, I, I plan to pay a lot in taxes because I'm going to keep making more and more money, so I don't have any problem paying more in taxes. That means I'm making more money. But they're all talking about the same thing. They're talking about wages. They, they are. They're talking about earning their income. They're yeah. talking about that, that ordinary income. And I'm going, when, when, you, when you have a choice, and, and you do, you have a clear choice of how you earn your income. I mean, it's like, you know, I always use you as an example, Robert, is you're, you're the best teacher I know, but you don't earn your money as a teacher in ordinary income. You earn it as business income. Right. So it's better income. So it's not taxed as high. So once again, your, your book is Tax-Free Wealth, and that woman was a CPA who was saying that, yeah. Jesus. Anyway, <laughs> not all CPAs are equal. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Get Tom's book, Tax-Free Wealth, and give it to your CPA. Now, Tom, you're talking about other things that there's a new tax laws change just recently? Yeah, there's a lot of new yeah. changes coming down the pike for 2016, right? Well, there are. In, uh, December, in December, they passed what was, <laughs> you'll love this, the, the name of this, Robert. It's called uh, Protecting Americans from Tax Hikes. Uh-oh. Or PAC. Well, it means so they're all getting course, tax hikes. <laughs> you know that it's the opposite, yeah. right? Um, but PATH actually, it did a lot of good things. For example, it made the Research and Development Tax Credit permanent. Um, first time ever it's been permanent. It made the Section 179 deduction, which many people do know about this, which is a deduction for equipment that you buy in your business. It means that you that that's permanent now. It's up to five hundred thousand dollars. That's permanent. It's always been just you know a temporary thing, and now it's permanent. It was an so incentive for a while to trying to manipulate the system. It, it, and now, now it's permanent, which I think is really good policy. Um, I actually think that the lobbyists had uh, a heyday um, in December because explain, they pretty much got everything they wanted. Yeah, explain research and development because that's what we do a lot of here, Richard. You do. And, and research and development is actually a tax benefit that people don't take advantage of that I think more, pe more business owners could. And it, it's simply that when, when you're trying out new things and you're spending money on experimental Type things, whether it be software, or in your case, it might be games, or it might be you know learning technology. methods or uh, technology. All of that, there's a credit for that, and 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 the federal credit is is a good credit. It's, it ends up being about six percent. So I mean, the, there's huge huge tax benefits from basically investing in your business's future. Discuss the difference between a tax credit and a tax deduction. That's a, that, that's a big one because a tax credit, that's dollar for dollar. So if you get a dollar tax credit, you pay a dollar less in tax. If you get a dollar tax deduction, 
that's based that that's just off your income. So it's going to be at whatever your tax rate is. So if you're in a thirty percent tax bracket, a dollar deduction is worth thirty cents. Okay, a okay. dollar deduction is worth thirty cents, but a dollar credit is always worth a dollar. Thank you. So, so Tom, what what other as as people are preparing now for their, sending their taxes and all of this coming up, what other changes are going to affect the individual taxpayer? Oh. Big you know, ones. there are what a are lot the, of them. There, what are the main one ones? One big one is, is that they, they changed the uh, education credit, and they made it permanent. And so that's one that what there's does a that lot mean? of. Well, it mean, it, there's a, so I think it's like a $2,500 credit now um, per year for all four years you go to, your kids go to college. And so, um, you, you know, that's something you can, that you absolutely should be looking at. I mean, all of these, the, the important thing here is that, to recognize that when, when you prepare a tax return, you, you know, there's not – I mean, like you say, not all tax preparers are created equal, and so make sure that your tax preparer understands the law and the changes in the law so well that when they're doing your tax return, they're taking advantage of these and asking you all the questions, asking you all the questions to get that information so that they can reduce your taxes. Because when we prepare tax returns, we spend a lot of time reducing taxes when we prepare the tax return. Final question there's is this. you can do. Do you have to be rich to take advantage of the tax laws? Oh my heavens, no! And and it, it, you you have to be an entrepreneur. I mean, the rich. You know, we, we, Ed was talking about Hillary Clinton's proposed four percent tax on five million dollar wage earners. Okay, well, there's there, there's a rich person who's going to pay pay more tax, but an entrepreneur could be making a hundred thousand dollars and get benefits that that five million dollar um, wage earner doesn't get. So it's just a it's a matter of how you earn your money, not how much you earn. Right. I have a doctor friend in California, and he's really happy he finally made a million dollars, but he's going to pay 70 percent in taxes. Oh, you know, that's not I mean, why would you do that? Yeah, I, I just don't understand. I mean, you know, it's not to say that you don't want to earn a million dollars as a doctor. It's just that why isn't he what's he going to do with a million dollars? Right. Well, because the, he should be investing in real estate, et cetera, et cetera. So that he has offsets to that million dollars. So the, and the offsets could be real estate. The offsets could be a part time business. The point. And I suggest you, if you want to find out more about what Tom has to say, go to ProhibitionWealth.com and definitely get your, his book, Tax-Free Wealth, and give it to your tax advisor. Because Kim and I have met many, many CPAs, and they, they, have, they have no guts. You know, they're more afraid of the IRS <laughs> than we are, and that's the problem. Well, we had one, we had one, tax, one tax planning strategist, and he was so afraid. He, I still remember he said, oh, you guys are way too heavy in real estate. You should be in mutual funds. And we're like, <laughs> Do you know what we do? <laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy. But here's the one thing, one big takeaway, and if, if nothing else, um, Ed McCaffrey is the author also of the book Tax Planning 101 by Borrow Die, and he writes for CNN.com. And one thing he says, and he's very aligned to Rich Dad, is the truly rich don't live off salaries. They live off their capital, being investments, cash flow. So when the government, when the politicians say we're going to tax the rich, they're not taxing the rich. They're taxing the high wage earners. They're not taxing the truly rich who understand the system. And it's like I said, this doctor friend of mine in California, he says, I finally made a million dollars, but he's only going to keep 300000 You know, I'm going, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. But to him, it's, he's happy. He's making more money. And when I say, why don't you get Tom's book, then, you know, his fear goes up. He says, I don't want to get an audit. So he'll just keep working harder and harder and harder, pay more and more in taxes. And that's where I would say 95% of the people are. Tom, how much is the fear of the IRS to raising people don't make any changes, would you say? Oh, I th- I, I, it's, it's huge. And, and, it's, and it's like you say, it's not just the fear of the, of the taxpayer. It's the fear of their advisor. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I talk to a CPA, and they're scared to death of the IRS. I'm going, why are you afraid of the IRS? I mean, it, you, you should know. Ten times more than the IRS. Why would you ever be afraid of them? That would be like LeBron James being afraid of playing basketball against a high school senior. Yeah. Well, and I why mean, are you it, not afraid of the IRS? Uh, <laughs> because I I have way more. I mean, put it in your terms. I have way more education than uh, an IRS auditor, so it doesn't bother me. I understand the tax law. I understand how it works, and uh, why would I be afraid of something I understand? Well, so that you, that'd be like me taking advice from a financial planner who just graduated with their Series Seven. You know, I mean, going give right. me a break here. I mean, you actually exactly. end up you actually end up educating the the tax auditor, don't you? Every time, every, every, <laughs> I love time. it. I, I, love had, it. I had one that actually asked me to write the report for her um, <laughs> because I love it. she just did not understand a lot. I mean, yeah. I, I spent time with her. She was very appreciative. I mean, I think you know, IRS auditors that, that's a tough job too. I mean, you know, so 
I don't, uh, I don't, I don't hate IRS auditors. I, I respect them because they're doing a real tough job. But they're not. They're typically you don't get a, You don't go to a, a great school and get out with straight A's um, with the goal of being, you know, working for the IRS. So. Right. <laughs> so Melissa, I'm going to ask Robert right now. Once again, you can submit your questions to ask Robert at richdadradio.com. So Melissa, what's the first question? Our first question today comes from Sheila in New Orleans. Favorite book: Rich Dad Poor Dad. She says, as an employee, what kind of tax planning can I do to keep more of my money? Well, that's the purpose of this program. And once again, towards the end of the last part, you don't have to be rich to pay less taxes. Correct. You have to be better educated, which takes financial education. You've got to be proactive. And have a little courage because yeah. you're going to find out most of your friends are absolutely terrified. Yet they, a lot of their friends are probably scamming a few bucks, you know, tax-free, you know, working for cash. Right. Which is tax evasion, right, Tom? Yep, that's right. no, that's exactly right. I, I think the average person probably does evade taxes in one way or another. Yeah, and you go to jail for that stuff. I, I met this one guy who works as a um, porter at the airport. He makes he says I make about one hundred fifty thousand in tips, but I only I only report seventy five of it. I said, right, you know, you know, that's good advice. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Tom, what so Tom, what can Sheila do as an employee? You know, she has to become an investor. I mean, she has to get the education because an employee, uh, you know, an employee, the best thing she can hope for is to is to defer her taxes or postpone them. So, you know, 401k, et cetera. I mean, that's that's really all there is for the for the employee. But if she takes that her money and takes her 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 knowledge and what she's learned over the years and she applies it either into a small business or investing in some sort, that that's where she ha- will start to get. Uh, the tax benefits. She has to be either an investor or an entrepreneur in order to get the tax benefits. Proactive. What are some of the stocks they can buy to pay less tax? You know, here's the thing. Buying stocks won't ever help you uh, pay fewer taxes on your wages. Right. That's the thing about investing and being and, and business is they'll actually help you pay less taxes on your wages, whereas buying stocks just helps you pay less tax on your investments. And so, if you want to pay less tax on your investments, buying stock, borrowing out, just like Ed says, is fine. But it, it really, there's nothing there that will help you unless you're doing it in a 401k. Um, there's nothing that will help you to, to offset your income. That's from good a, to a, know. A, 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 yeah. That's good to know. So that's, that's a very middle class strategy. And, you know, people like people say get out of debt. You know, that doesn't fit with us. Now, most people are right. terrified of debt also, as well, they should be. Most people only know there's bad debt. They, yeah. only, they don't know there's good debt. And that's what most right. people do. Yes. And they, they take advice from CPAs and attorneys who also do the same thing. The reason we have the second book in Rich Dad, Poor Dad is the cash flow quadrant, E, S, B, and I. E stands for employee. S stands for self-employed or small business or specialist like a doctor or lawyer. They pay the highest taxes. E's and S's pay the highest taxes. The people that pay the least are B's and I's. And so it's a complete mind shift plus skill shifts. So when I got out of the Marine Corps in 1973, my rich dad said, rather, you know, my, my poor dad wanted me to get my MBA. And goes, he, he thought that was, you know, my, my poor dad thought that'd be great. So I climbed the corporate ladder. And my rich dad says, you're not going to make it that way. It's best you become an investor. So in 1973, I took a little real estate investment course that then I understood tax. And then I started buying real estate. So today, the reason Kim and I don't need jobs, we don't pay tax, we make a lot of money, is we started off in the I quadrant, not the E and the S quadrant. So if you understand that, it's pretty much mindset, which is why we have the Rich Dad Radio Show, and we thank you for listening to it. Next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Mark in Boulder, Colorado. Favorite book, Rich Dad Guide to Investing. He says, do you foresee the rich being able to continue to take advantage of the tax laws forever? Or put another way, Will the tax laws change in the future, or could it be something more drastic, such as a revolution? Well, in today's economy, anything is possible, and I think a revolution is not possible. It is possible, but not highly likely right now. But that was the American Revolution, 1773. It was a tax revolt. And the way Bernie Sanders is going in the American, in the American election and all that, and Hillary talking about taxing the rich, that that fervor that uh, we want to tax the rich is going to increase, and that's the concern. But I think a bigger question, I asked Tom this, aren't the tax laws basically the same all over the world, not just in the United States? All over the world. All over the world, they're the same. Whenever, where we, when we, we've been in China, we've been in Australia, we've been in, in Germany. Europe, we've been in Russia. Um, and, and every time, it doesn't matter where we go, I always look at the tax law before we go in that country, and it's always the same. It's the wage earner who gets hammered, 
and it's the investor and the entrepreneur who get the tax benefits. And that will, to answer the, the question um, that, that was posed, that will, I think, always be the case unless unless some politician uh, or, the, or the public finally decides, you know what, we're not going to use taxes to – for a policy from a, as a policy vehicle we're going to use taxes just to raise money if that were the case then we might see that revolution but until that happens until people are willing to give up their home mortgage interest deduction or their charitable contribution deduction or their 401k deduction you know and, and uh, as long as it's somebody else's tax benefit that gets wiped out and not mine it's never going to happen so is revolution possible? Yes, but will people change? Probably not. <laughs> and, 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 and also one of the things today, I mean, isn't it true, Tom, that about 50 percent of Americans don't pay any taxes? There, there's a huge percentage that don't pay taxes. Uh, uh, their, their income is not high enough yeah. to pay taxes. So, so there is a huge disparity between the rich and the poor. I, I think, though, that, Robert, your designation of it is the, the high income earner, not the wealthy individual that's paying the high taxes. And the, the, the individual who is a lower wage earner, 100000 200000 they're going to pay high taxes, whereas the individual who's the entrepreneur investor that's, earning, that's making one hundred, two hundred thousand, 200000 will pay less taxes. You know, that's really the game. And so that's why we have Rich Dad Radio. That's why we have the cash flow quadrant. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Rich Dad's Guide to Investing, and all of those things. So you can submit your questions once again to Ask Robert at richdadradio.com. We thank you for your questions, but just want you to leave you with this thought. You know, the reason most people pay taxes has nothing to do with the rich. It has to do with most people are checking. They're so afraid. <laughs> walk, 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 walk. And if you're gonna, if you're not gonna make some changes, and you're gonna be more afraid of being taxed, and then what the government's gonna say, and what your tax advisor's gonna say. You'll probably just keep paying taxes. There is a kind of little guideline that Kim and I have, and it's a saying that goes, for things to change, first I must change. You want to change the tax law, 